The moon is one of the most beautiful celestial bodies you'd ever see. Orbiting our planet like a trusted servant, the moon, however, has a mysterious side to it. According to Buzz Aldrin, the moon landing hero. In recent interviews, Buzz Aldrin has come out with certain revelations about the moon's far side that's unknown to man, and it is causing a bit of uproar in certain quarters. Who's Buzz Aldrin? What does the far side of the moon mean, and what are the consequences for us all? Join us in this video as we look into how Buzz Aldrin breaks the silence about a secret mission to the far side of the moon. On July 20th, 1969, the Apollo 11 crew of three landed on the moon. Six hours and 39 minutes later, a human stepped on the moon's surface for the first time. It was magical. The moon landing was the accumulation of decades of research, training, and testing. It was a mark of the human tendency to dare the impossible and reach for things beyond the normal. But it also was three men in a glass and steel airtight capsule flying through space in what is essentially a bomb. One of the men was Buzz Aldrin, the second man to ever step foot on the moon. Now, many decades after that moon landing, Aldrin has come out with stunning revelations about the far side of the moon. Buzz Aldrin was born Edwin Eugene Aldrin Jr. on January 20, 1930, in Montclair, New Jersey. He was born into the family of Edwin Eugene Aldrin, a U.S. Air Force colonel, and Marion Moon, the daughter of an Army chaplain. Aldrin got his nickname, Buzz, from his childhood. His little sister would find it too hard to say brother. She would instead call him Buzzer. The name stuck with him, and he legally adopted it in 1988. In 1947, Aldrin graduated from Montclair High School in Montclair, New Jersey, where he had been a consistent A student and played football in the undefeated 1946 squad. He later received a Bachelor of Science degree in 1951 from the U.S. Military Academy West Point in New York, graduating third in his class. While his father wanted him to go to a multi-engine flight school so he could take charge of his flight crew, Aldrin decided against that and joined the U.S. Air Force in 1951 as he wanted to become a fighter pilot. He also was amazing in the Air Force as he finished nearly top of his class and began training in 1951. During his military career, Aldrin flew 66 combat missions over Korea in F-86 Sabre jets, fighting the invasion of South Korea by the North Korea Communist forces. After a ceasefire was declared between North and South Korea in July 1953, and following a brief stint in West Germany, Aldrin returned to the United States. He then continued his education at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology with the intention of becoming a test pilot. Ten years later, Aldrin received a doctorate of science in astronautics from MIT. His 1963 thesis titled Guidance for Manned Orbital Rendezvous hinted at his future endeavors. According to his NASA biography, Aldrin has honorary degrees from six colleges and universities. In 1963, just six years before the moon landing, NASA selected Aldrin as part of the third group of men to attempt spaceflight. His role was to take charge of the development of spacecraft docking and rendezvous techniques. He also took part in underwater training tests designed to simulate the conditions in zero-gravity flights. Following his success in this test, he was picked alongside astronaut Jim Lovell on Gemini 12, the tenth and final crewed flight of the Gemini program. During the four-day flight, Buzz Aldrin did three spacewalks that ran for about five hours and 30 minutes, which was a record at the time. The goal of these spacewalks was to demonstrate that humans can function in the vacuum of space. After the onboard Gemini radar failed, Aldrin put his docking and rendezvous skills to good use, manually recalculating all of the docking maneuvers for the flight. After the Gemini 12 mission, Aldrin was assigned to the backup crew of Apollo 8 alongside Armstrong. Unknown to them, just three years later, they would be making history rather than playing a backup role. According to the plans laid out by President John F. Kennedy on May 25, 1961, the main objective of the Apollo 11 mission was to perform a crewed lunar landing and return to Earth. Secondary objectives would include scientific exploration by the lunar module and the deployment of a television camera to transmit signals to Earth. The Apollo 11 crew comprised Armstrong, who was the commander of the mission, Aldrin, who was the lunar module pilot, and Michael Collins, who was the command module pilot. On July 16, 1969, 
the spacecraft was launched from Cape Kennedy, now called Cape Canaveral, in Florida. After launch, it reached an initial Earth orbit of 114 by 116 miles and then a translunar orbit two hours, 44 minutes after launch. Three days after launch, the crew reached lunar orbit, and the following day, Armstrong and Aldrin entered the Apollo Lunar Module Eagle and began their descent to the lunar surface. The Apollo Lunar Module Eagle landed at the Moon Sea of Tranquility at 4.17 p.m. EDT on July 20, 1969. At 10.56 p.m. EDT, with an estimated 650 million people watching on TV across the globe, Armstrong became the first human to set foot on the moon, saying, That's one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. Aldrin joined him moments later and described his first thought of the moon as one of magnificent desolation. The duo then spent two and a half hours exploring the moon and collecting lunar samples. Aldrin and Armstrong remained on the lunar surface for a total of 21 hours and 36 minutes, which included a seven-hour rest period. As Aldrin and his fellow astronaut departed the moon to meet up with Collins and the Columbia Command Module, they left behind an American flag, a patch honoring the fallen Apollo 1 crew, and a plaque on one of Eagle's legs. The plaque read, Here men from the planet Earth first set foot upon the moon. July 1969, A.D., we came in peace for all mankind. Four days later, July 24, 1969, the three-man crew safely splashed down in the Pacific Ocean off Hawaii. From the time of its launch on July 16, 1969, until its return on July 24, almost every major aspect of the flight of Apollo 11 was broadcast via television to hundreds of millions of people in nearly every part of the globe. The whole experience was also beautiful, as the 363 feet high, 7 million pound Saturn V launch vehicle lifted flawlessly from Pad 39A at Cape Kennedy, now Cape Canaveral, witnessed by hundreds of thousands of spectators. In fact, the translunar insertion was so accurate that three of the en route trajectory corrections planned were not necessary. In hindsight, Armstrong exclaimed, This Saturn gave us a magnificent ride. It was beautiful! Upon landing, Armstrong and Aldrin set up a device to measure the composition of the solar wind reaching the moon. They launched another device to receive laser beams from astronomical observatories on Earth to determine the exact distance of the two bodies from one another. They also set up a passive seismometer to measure moonquakes and meteor impacts long after the astronauts had returned home. They collected about 50 pounds of rock and soil samples, took many photographs, and maintained constant communication with mission control in Houston, Texas. The splashdown of Apollo 11 occurred in the Pacific Ocean, about 900 miles west of Hawaii, on July 24. The astronauts were immediately placed in quarantine in a van on the recovery ship. From there, they were flown to the Manned Spacecraft Center in Houston, where they were transferred into the large 58-room lunar receiving laboratory. The quarantine lasted for 21 days from the time Eagle took off from the moon. During that period, the astronauts were checked for any diseases they might have picked up on the moon, and the lunar samples were subjected to preliminary analysis. After the crew had safely returned to Earth and all biological tests had been carried out, Aldrin was awarded the Presidential Medal of Freedom and embarked on a 45-day international goodwill tour. In 1971, after 21 years, Aldrin retired from active service. He returned to the Air Force in a managerial role, recounting his experiences in his memoir titled Magnificent Desolation, The Long Journey Home from the Moon. Aldrin compares his state of mind after returning to Earth to his response to viewing the moon's landscape for the first time. In his inability to explain how he felt and describe the magnitude of the experience, he ended up in depression and alcohol dependence. I wanted to resume my duties, but there were no duties to resume, Aldrin said in the book. There was no goal, no sense of calling, no project worth pouring myself into. Encouraged by his girlfriend at the time, Beverly Van Zell, Aldrin checked into an alcohol rehabilitation center in August 1975. Although the 28-day stint was enough to make Aldrin realize the depth of his issues, however, it did not prevent further relapses. Finally, Aldrin gave up alcohol for good in October 1978. Ten years later, Aldrin founded the Share Space Foundation, now called the Aldrin Family Foundation, a nonprofit organization dedicated to promoting the expansion of crewed space exploration. 
Lately, Aldrin has been granted interviews and has suggested that the Apollo 11 crew had a secret mission to the far side of the moon. The far side of the moon is the part of the moon that always faces away from Earth, which is opposite to the near side because of synchronous rotation in the moon's orbit. To understand this, you have to understand tidal locking. Think of this as two guys locked in a fight, with one in the center of the room and another walking around him. And due to the positioning of the guy in the middle of the room, the other guy at the end of the room will only be able to see the front-facing part of the other guy. This is what happens with the moon. Except that there is no animosity between the two celestial bodies. Tidal locking is the phenomenon by which a body has the same rotational period as its orbital period around a partner. This means that the moon is tidally locked to the Earth because it rotates at the same time as it takes to orbit the Earth. That is why we only see one side of the moon. If both bodies are of comparable size and are close to each other, both bodies can be tidally locked to each other, as with the case in the pluto charon system. Tidal locking is a natural consequence of the gravitational distortions induced by a body on another. As such, tidal forces from Earth have slowed the Moon's rotation to the point where the same side is always facing the Earth. The other face, most of which is never visible from the Earth, is, therefore, called the far side of the Moon. Now, in comparison to the near side, the side of the Moon that we can see facing us, the far side's terrain is rugged, with a multitude of impact craters and relatively few flat and dark lunar maria, which is Latin for seas. This terrain gives it an appearance closer to other barren places in the solar system, such as Mercury and Callisto. It also has one of the largest craters in the solar system, the South Pole Aitken Basin. This hemisphere is sometimes called the dark side of the moon. This, however, doesn't mean that there is no sunlight happening to it. It simply means dark, as unknown, instead of lacking sunshine. The two hemispheres of the moon have distinctly different appearances, with the near side covered with multiple large maria, Maria is the physical deformation of the Moon's surface due to contact with other celestial bodies like asteroids or comets. This physical differentiation is called Maria since the earliest astronomers incorrectly thought that these planes were seas of lunar water. The far side of the Moon has a battered, densely cratered appearance with few Maria, with only 1% of the surface of the far side covered by Maria, compared to about 31% on the near side. Although the far side has less maria when compared to the near side, it actually has more visible craters. This was thought to be a result of the effects of lunar lava flows, which cover and obscure craters, rather than a shielding effect from the Earth. NASA calculates that the Earth obscures only about 4 square degrees out of 41,000 square degrees of the sky, as seen from the Moon. This makes the Earth act as a terrible shield for the Moon. And since both sides of the Moon may have received equal numbers of impacts, the resurfacing by lava results in fewer craters visible on the near side than on the far side. Newer research, however, suggests that heat from Earth at the time the Moon was formed is the reason the near side has fewer impact craters. The lunar crust consists primarily of plagioclases formed when aluminum and calcium condensed and combined with silicates in the mantle. The cooler far side experienced condensation of these elements sooner and so formed a thicker crust. Meteoroid impacts on the near side would sometimes penetrate the thinner crust here and release basaltic lava that created the maria just, but would rarely do so on the far side. And that due to the fact that the far side of the moon is shielded from radio transmissions from the Earth, it has been suggested as a good location for astronomers to place their radio telescopes. This is because small, bowl-shaped craters provide a natural formation for a stationary telescope similar to Arecibo in Puerto Rico. However, before deploying radio telescopes to the far side, several problems must be overcome. 1. The fine lunar dust can contaminate equipment, vehicles, and spacesuits and thus must be prevented. 2. The conducting materials used for the radio dishes must also be carefully shielded against the effects of solar flares. Finally, the area around the telescopes must be protected against contamination by other radio sources. A site being considered as a location for a future radio telescope is the L2 Lagrange point of the Earth-Moon system, which is located about 39,000 miles above the far side. Here, the radio telescope will be able to perform a litigious orbit about the Lagrangian point. Also, one of NASA's missions to the Moon would send a sample return lander to the South Pole Aitken Basin, the location of a major impact event that created a formation nearly 1,500 miles across. 
The force of this impact has created a deep penetration into the lunar surface, and a sample returned from this site could be analyzed for information concerning the interior of the moon. Because the near side is partly shielded from the solar wind by the Earth, the far side Maria is also expected to have the highest concentration of helium-3 on the surface of the moon. This isotope is relatively rare on the Earth, but has good potential for use as a fuel in fusion reactors. Proponents of lunar settlement have cited the presence of this material as a reason for developing a moon base. These functional purposes have been listed as some of the reasons for the secret mission to the far side of the moon by Buzz Aldrin. While all these have been going on for the past few decades since the moon landing, a large group of the population thinks the moon landing was faked. President Bill Clinton, in his 2004 autobiography, recounts the story of a carpenter he worked with in August 1969, not long after the Apollo 11 landing. He wrote, The old carpenter asked me if I really believed it happened. I said sure, I saw it on television. He disagreed. He said that he didn't believe it for a minute that them television fellers could make things look real that weren't. In the words of historian Howard McCurdy, To some, the thrill of space can't hold a candle to the thrill of conspiracy. One of the themes that was pushed around this period was that the United States, due to the Cold War, needed to win the race to the moon. But when NASA realized that it couldn't send men to the moon, they faked the landing to save face and national prestige. It then used the massive funds dedicated to the effort to pay off those who might be persuaded to tell the truth. It also used threats and, in some instances, criminal actions to stop those who might blow the whistle. Another common suggestion is that in the latter 1960s, with the U.S. government in disarray because of the debacle of the Vietnam War, the racial crisis in the cities, and social upheaval, the Apollo program proved an ideal, positive distraction, a convenient conspiracy designed to obscure other issues. One story published in 1970 painted this belief as expressed by an African-American preacher. It's all a deliberate effort to mass problems at home. Newsweek quoted him saying, The people are unhappy and this takes their minds off their problems. In one incident on September 9, 2002, Sebrel confronted Buzz Aldrin at a Los Angeles hotel and called him a liar, a thief, and a coward. At this point, Aldrin, now 72 years old, hit Sebrel with a right hook that sent him to his knees. While Sebrel pressed charges, the Los Angeles County District Attorney's Office declined to pursue the incident. Most people who viewed the video of this altercation expressed concern that Aldrin might have hurt his hand. With a majority of the populace believing that the moon landing was faked, it could be a great distraction from whatever research NASA is planning on doing on the far side of the moon. While no one can say for sure what exactly is on the far side of the moon, some say it's an alien spy base. All we know is that NASA is interested in it, and it is at least a 50-decade-year-old interest. Thank you for watching another episode of Voyager. While you are still here, click on the video on your screen to see more mind-blowing videos like this one.